Uh, we're going to continue in the study of our in the book of Acts, and um, we start out with uh, what was happening on the day of Pentecost. Just before that, the apostles and what happened uh, when they voted in another apostle, and it led up to the day of Pentecost and, and some events that had happened. Uh, Peter gets up and be begins, and we started this last week, and we, we went over the sermon that he preached, and uh, he, he took it from Joel and a couple passages out of psalms and this week we're actually going to dive in to find out what the crowd's response was to that sermon and but before we start we're going to have a word of prayer you guys are looking close back here i, I like the love they're hugging on each other that's good look up like, whoa they're hugging on each other that's good love so we're gonna have a word of prayer and then we'll get started our heavenly father lord we just lift you up this morning father we thank you for uh, this time you've given us to come together lord we just pray that you'll forgive us of our sins and our wrongs and set our heart in the right direction. Father, communicate with us this morning, Lord, and show us the things you want us to do. And we pray the services will honor and glorify you. We just thank you for uh, the uh, Backyard Bible Club and the, the events that happened there and the contacts that were made. Father, we just pray for a special blessing for each one of those conversations, Lord, and for those children and also for their parents. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to even be able to do that. We ask all these things in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. So in the book of Acts, Peter had started this sermon, and the men of the, that were surrounding, that were watching the events going on, their first, their first reaction was, well, these guys are drunk. And Peter gets up, and he kind of starts off kind of lightheartedly a little bit, and he says, you know, we're not drunk because it's not even the noon hour of the day. So he kind of eases attention a little bit, and he goes into this sermon, and he... he uh, speaks of uh, prophetic uh, scriptures that were mentioned in Joel and he also speaks of, of some scriptures in Psalm and he starts to unveil what this is talking about and one of the things that he, he talks about was uh, a Messiah that was going to come and he teaches them that the Messiah wasn't King David because King David was dead and they could go see his grave and things like that and Peter makes a bold statement you know and I've read this a lot of times and it's amazing how you go back and you read something and and you go back and you see something different and it made me see the crucifixion even differently than I saw it before preparing for this. And I'll tell you one of the things that, that hit me. Peter made a comment to them that, that the blood of Christ was on their hands. They were responsible for the crucifixion. And they were all guilty of it. And, but God was responsible for the resurrection. And because of that resurrection, if they placed their faith in it, their guilt would be, they would be justified in front of God by accepting his sacrifice. It, may, it hit me that, you know what, that every person that dies without Christ are going to stand before God for crucifying Jesus because their sins nailed Christ to the cross. And God's going to hold them accountable for the sin that crucified the Messiah. Now, God allowed those events to happen. He, he foreordained that they would happen. But the guilt of man's sin was not on God. That sacrifice had to be made because of man's sin, not because uh, God had ordained that, that man would sin. We are, we are responsible for our sin. God holds us accountable. And Peter told them that. He said, you know what? You are responsible for the crucifixion. It's because of your sins. And Peter realized because of his sins. And it really hit me and dawned on me that without the resurrection, which I think we know, um, without the resurrection, there was no salvation. God showed his... Um, his acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice by resurrecting him the third day. And we can't get past the point that, that the reason he had to go to Calvary, the reason that he accepted God's will to do that uh, was because of the sins of man. That was the only possible way that sin could be paid for. And each person it, born into this world is responsible for Christ being crucified. Now the Bible says, taught that he did it at his own will, that no man could take his life, uh, that he could lay it down and he could raise it up again. But it goes back to the point that, that the, we, we celebrate the cross sometimes. With, you, know, you see the crucifix, and you know, they got that nice jewelry, and we'll put nice crosses up. The cross was an ugly, ugly thing up until that point. It was, a, it was a disgrace to hang on a tree. The Bible says, cursed is a man that hangs upon a tree. It was a horrible way to die. And then God pours out his judgment on Jesus Christ that was intended for me. So think about it from a logical sense. If I die without placing my faith in Christ, without placing my faith in that resurrected uh, king of kings, what's going to happen is God's going to hold me responsible for the sin that nailed Christ to the cross. That's a scary scary thought now it makes sense when paul said it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living god his his judgment is going to be poured out upon those that don't accept christ the difference is 
they won't be resurrected from the dead because they didn't do the works that satisfied God. Jesus is the only one that completed the work that satisfied God, that endured that judgment and submitted himself to it where God said, this is my beloved son, and he raised him from the dead. And Peter preached that sermon. And we're going to find out what the reaction was. And it was funny because I went back and I read that three or four times. Um, and I knew my sins um, were responsible for Christ going to the cross. He did that for me. He did that for you. But I don't think it ever really sunk in until I read that again, that the responsibility that laid upon me as an individual, if I didn't accept the promise of a, of a risen Savior or a Messiah, these men came and they were kind of looking for that. They were trying to find answers. And one of the things, when I go back to the crucifixion again and just talk about that. Um, God recognized the need of mankind. And his reaction, it goes back to him being a God of love and pouring out his love. When he poured out his judgment on Jesus Christ, he was pouring out his love on us. Because he, he took the sin that he knew we couldn't bear, or the penalty of sin that we couldn't bear, and he put it upon his own son. So he's given us every opportunity to come clean with our sin, to, to place faith in Jesus Christ. Peter preaches that sermon, and, and he, he hits a point, and we're going to get into that about, okay, what are you going to do with this? And a lot of times today, I don't know how many times, I don't know if you've ever run across this when you've witnessed. I know I've ran across it when I've witnessed. People tell me, well, I've always been saved. I've just always been saved. I've heard that a lot, especially people that have been in church. And there's an event that happens here we're going to get into and there's, there's a conviction of the Holy Spirit that you've heard the gospel and your sins, which are responsible for Christ's crucifixion, that you're pricked in the heart about that and you realize your guilt, there's no salvation. You have to realize you're, you're guilty before you can be saved or before you can be justified. And that happens at this event. Um, he, the, uh, as, as Peter went through and he spoke this sermon, he talked about the crucifixion. He also taught that the resurrection proved that Jesus was Christ. I mean, that was the explanation. There's been a lot of religious leaders, and a lot of men say that Jesus was a great moral and spiritual leader. And they'll compare him to guys like Muhammad, who actually was not a great spiritual leader, but anyway, people in the world think that. Although, uh, 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 comparing him to great prophets or whatever, and the Bible actually shows that Christ was more than that because his resurrection proved it. There's a lot of people that have been martyred, even for Christianity, even uh, saints of the church that have been put to death. Only one's been resurrected by God to prove he was Lord and Savior. It wasn't the fact that he was martyred that made him Christ and Lord. It was the fact that he was martyred and murdered and was resurrected that made him Lord. And he proved it. He proved it by his resurrection. So my salvation depends on this. My salvation depends on me realizing that my sins are responsible for Christ being crucified. And I have accepted the fact that, you know what, he died and was resurrected on my behalf. Soon as I do that and I come clean with God and I open my heart up and God changes me and, and, and he converts me and he, and he puts me on the right path. Soon as that happens, that resurrection applies to my life that I won't stay in the grave either. Because the works of Christ automatically apply to me, not based on the good things that I do, but based on the faith I put in the person that's done the works on my behalf. Now, here's what this should do. It should compel me to want to do good works for God. That's Christian living. My relationship for Christ, or trying to have a relationship with Christ, does not save me. But my surrender to this gospel saves me and should drive me to good works. And this is what's about to happen here. So that's kind of the whole introduction. And we're going to uh, see the response. And we're going to start in verse 37 of chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And we'll read and, and, and comment. I'm going to read 37 through 41 to start. And actually, I'm going to breathe for a minute. I'm going to ask if Brother Nick would read those scriptures for me. Verse 37 to 41. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Okay, I'm a firm believer that salvation that comes to man is no different now than it was then, and it was no different before then. But I want to ask, when Peter preached that sermon, what do you notice about their response? Just in reading those few scriptures. What shall we do? 
I'll show what we do. Uh, did anybody um, did anybody make that statement before the preaching of the word? Okay, so there was something that happened. Peter presented the truth. They said, what shall we do? And the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts. And it talks about, you notice what it talked about? Who called them to salvation? That tells me something. And I've heard this. Have you ever witnessed to someone and they say, I can't do that now. I'll do it some other time. I, I, I'm just not ready now. You can't just pick the day you're going to be saved. You're called to salvation. And I have a firm belief that God will call men to salvation. But you know what? It doesn't mean he's going to continue to call them. You might get one shot at this. And, and, and it's going to be on God's timing. And there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why people will tell you, you know what, I'm just not ready. I'll do it in the future. I've had young people say, you know, how much I'd have to give up if I, if I surrender my life to God. I've had friends of mine tell me that. that are into bowling leagues and softball and all this type of stuff. And oh, I, how much we'd have to give up. And we'll do it later. And it's the pride of man that realizes you are being called by the creator of the universe who made a specific sacrifice for you. And we brought this out actually last night with the kids. Even if, if Brother Nick would have been the only one in the world that would have sinned, God would have made that sacrifice for him. It's, it's a very personal, individual type thing, an intimate thing that happens. And you're telling the creator of the universe who made that sacrifice, oh, just wait, just wait. And these men, the Bible says, you know what? As Andrew said, they said, what must we do? And it was driven by the fact they were called and they answered the call. There was other places in the Bible where it says men were pricked in the heart. You remember Stephen, we'll get into that in the later book of Acts, uh, men that he was, were pricked in the heart. It pricked them in the heart to anger. And it's amazing when you witness the people, when you present the gospel. I've talked about baseball with people. I've talked about, I like ice hockey. I've never seen anybody get emotionally and, and tears well up because uh, we have different hockey teams. But you start talking about the gospel, you get a reaction out of people. It's either... Uh, sometimes it's hostile. Um, sometimes it's met with screaming and yelling and, and profanities. I, you know what? I like that as much as the uh, person that's repentant because that, you know that the Holy Spirit's working on them. Um, talk to atheists that get just insanely angry when you make an, an argument about the existence of God. Yeah. When you said that, that word agitated or prick means violently agitated. Yeah, I mean, got your attention, you know? And one of the things that was funny with, with, with atheists, I've never got into a heated debate with anybody and got angry or upset if somebody's debating with me the existence of Santa Claus. Never have. So if God doesn't really exist, why do you think those atheists are getting so upset? Because they're being pricked in the heart. I've never been pricked. You know, somebody says, hey, Scott, there's no Santa Claus. Oh, yeah, okay, duh. Okay. I don't say this in front of little kids because you never know what their parents tell them. Now, I, sidebar, my mom and dad never did uh, go to the Santa Claus things because they didn't want some fictional character to get credit for presents they were buying me. And I always kind of liked that thing. Why should we give this guy credit for the stuff that we work for and bought you, you know? So then all of a sudden, mom and dad's like, yeah, cool. Mom and dad got that for me. Um, there's, a res there's an attitude change in verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The same crowd earlier on were saying, these guys are drunk. And now they're referring to them um, as brethren, a sign of affection. It shows their hearts been softened. And then it goes on, as, as Brother Nick said, that, that they were pierced in their heart. It shows their feelings were deep anguish and they realized they were guilty for killing the Messiah. They were just stabbed in the heart by the Holy Spirit. And it's not talking about so much your heart that beats, but the very inner part of man, the Holy Spirit reaches down inside there and affects that. And that happens every time somebody's saved. It's not, I, Brother Andrew was talking about repeating a prayer or, or answering an altar call or shaking a preacher's hand or things like that. It is contingent on the Holy Spirit doing a work that he's promised to do. The Bible guarantees that when people hear, hear, the, hear the gospel, the purified, unadulterated gospel, the truth that Jesus Christ, the truth that men are guilty of sending him to Calvary, the truth that even though we've done this hyenas, horrible thing with our sins and we crucified the only person that was ever pure in, in the history of the world, that God is going to forgive us based on his approval of the resurrection, showing that he approved that plan, that sacrifice. And the pre presentation of that gospel in the right way, um, through the way it should affect us as Christians, the Holy Spirit guarantees he is going to deal with men's hearts and he's going to prick their heart. He's going to stab them in the heart, the innermost part of it. I was talking to Brother Andrew last night about just some of the churches that do um, um, the uh, discipleship programs where it's almost like you read a textbook, any book other than the Bible, 
And 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 I, I made a comment. Okay, I actually want to clarify when I was preaching one day uh, about um, the guy down in Texas, Joel Olstein. I made a comment that a lot of times we'll look at Joel Olstein. And I said, but we have to be careful. And I wasn't justifying what Joel Olstein did because I think he's a disgrace to the pulpit. What I was saying was he puts no credence in the gospel. We have churches right now, by, by, they might not say that. He made the comment that the doctrine of the apostles, on Larry King, he was, uh, quote was that the doctrine of the apostles is outdated. Well, you know right off the bat where he stands. And, we, you know, it's evil. Uh, there's uh, no godliness in what he preaches at all. We have churches that call themselves Baptists by their actions do the same thing because they're not teaching the gospel anymore. They'll do programs. They'll do, uh, let's get, uh, what's one of them, the, the purpose of what the, that guy out in California's book. That's it, yeah. Woohoo! Purpose-driven life. Well, there's a purpose-driven life that we're reading here. It's the gospel. Can't get any better than that. And we have churches that have got to the point that thanks to preaching of these sermons, like Peter preached, is outdated. That we've, we're, we've, we're smarter than that. We've hit this level of intelligence that, and, we, and we're spiritual. And you know what men need to hear? They need to hear the thing that's going to convict them. The Holy Spirit is guaranteed that he will convict men of their sins if we present the gospel. So we have to wonder, how come we're not seeing men convicted that way? Forget about even the, uh, we're not seeing men saved. How come we don't see men convicted like that in a lot of our churches? Because we get these uh, messages of positivity. And if you just think positive, everything will be good. You can think yourself positively and have good intentions, and you can have good intentions and positive thinking all the way to hell. My good intentions, my positive thinking, any of those things is not going to get me to heaven. The only thing that gets me to heaven is for me to recognize and be pricked in the heart and, 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 and react to that, that you know what? My heart was pricked. It was attacked by the Holy Spirit. The conviction came upon me, and I fell down before my God, and I, and I pleaded for salvation, and I trusted Christ. You know, here's the thing. We've got to humble ourselves before God. In this lifetime, you're going to have to take a knee before Jesus Christ. And the Bible guarantees that you'll do it in this life, or you'll do it in the next one. Everybody's going to bow their knee to Christ. I love bowing my knee to Christ. There is some, something about being on your knees and praying that's just you and him. That's the safest place in the world, man. And it's an honor to get down on my knees before my Savior. And these men said, what shall we do? Peter makes an interesting statement in this address. You notice that their, their, their hearts had started to change. They call these men brethren. The Holy Spirit, I stabbed them in the heart. That he convict them of their terrible sin. Um, I would say they were spiritually wounded. So all this stuff I brought up about positive thinking and feeling good about yourself and, and uh, the statements, well, I've always been saved. I'll just do type of good works and things like that. Uh, so he, I'm going to pick on Andrew because he does the firefighting stuff. And he's done the, you know, I, I'm sure he's been in situations where people have been wounded and hurt. Have you ever tr uh, been able to, have you ever went up to somebody that uh, has not been wounded and try to give them medical help? No. It's kind of silly. Well, same thing here. They had been wounded, and they had to be wounded before they could be healed. I'm going to pick on Jayla. She's up front. Good Baptist, right up front. All these other guys in the back, you're up front. Jayla was saved later in life and had gone through church her whole life. But until she was wounded in here, she couldn't be healed. And the person that wounds you is the Holy Spirit. So there cannot be any healing without being wounded first. If, if a person never has had this conviction, when, I, when I'm part of ordination services, I always ask preachers two things. Tell me your salvation story and tell me about your call to the ministry. Because if there is no um, wounding of the soul, there is no, and trust me, if you've been through it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There can't be salvation. When I was called to preach, it was another type of wounding. Because now all of a sudden my focus was, everybody needs to hear this. And if anybody dies and goes to hell because of me, I had this big guilt coming over me. And I was wounded, and I had to answer that again. And, and then there was healing. You answer the call, Scott, okay. And then Christian living's that way. He'll convict you after you're saved and guide you through the Holy Spirit. Whew, this is fun. The conviction of sin is often missing one note in today's world. The evangelism effort of the church. The church is sent out to evangelize, and the Holy Spirit's going to act on that. This idea that, well, I don't need to go to church. It's just me and God. It's a ridiculous notion because they asked Peter, what shall we do? And we're going to see what Peter answered him with. He didn't say, you know what, go home and stay home and watch football and set up a little altar in your house, and that's church. Went to a gospel concert. Bill Gaither, 
Everybody know Bill Gaither, you know? Uh, monopolized gospel music for profit's sake, but that's okay. And there's a lady got up and said some good singing there. Lady got up and sang, and she says, oh, we're having church now. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> this is a kind, I had to pay uh, 30 bucks to get into this thing, you know? This isn't church. Ain't nobody getting up preaching. You know, nobody's going to be convicted. But in half the songs they sang in the last show that we saw were secular Christmas songs. It was a Christmas concert, so it was like, it was a nice show, clean entertainment, but it wasn't church. And, and Peter's going to get into what true church is. Um, there must be conviction before there can be repentance. You cannot repent unless you've been wounded and convicted. If somebody says, well, you know, I've always, I've, I've dealt with this in Methodist churches. I've had a, a pleasure of uh, being able to preach in, in some churches that were just totally different than what we believe. And I believe personally, and our church believes, and God's given me the opportunity to preach there. And they're very big on good morals and good works. Some of the nicest, most moral people that you'll ever meet. But they never have reach conviction and they think they're saved and there cannot be salvation there cannot be repentance unless there's big conviction you cannot go knocking on heaven's door okay god i'm ready to be saved god's got a call on you the bible says that no man that nobody seeks after god so it's kind of ridiculous to think we can seek him for salvation because we're not going to unless he comes and hunts us first um we need god's holy law to show sinners are in a desperate condition only then can they feel or apply a promise of God's grace and gospel. If we don't know God's laws, why do you think Satan attacks morality so much? We got this thing today about nothing's absolute. You probably heard that. What's right for Brother Andrew may not be right for me. And we justify this and we justify that. And we, 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 uh, we coin phrases like little white lies, you know, and we'll say, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take uh, cuss words and we'll change them just a little bit like we're trying to fool God. We didn't come right out and say it, but we said something that kind of uh, kind of means the same thing, you know, and, and then we'll, 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 we'll uh, gloss that over and things like that. Man needs to know God's moral code so they know how far they are from that. You know, it's wrong. If you've lied, I don't care if it's a little white light, you sinned against God, uh, you're as guilty as putting Christ on the cross as the most hyena serial killer. Your sins put Jesus Christ on the cross, even with a little white lie. Um, I've told you the story. I was saved when I was eight. I told lies when I was a kid. Um, Andrew and Jayla got kids. Jack, or Nick, I'm thinking of Jack. Nick's got kids. Those sweet little innocent children uh, have looked at their parents, and they have lied because they're little sinners. And the, the thing is, they have to hit an age, a certain point in their life to where that moral code convicts them of their sins that comes from the parents why, why does satan tear down homes they don't he doesn't want mom and dad being morally in tune with god because that's the first place they're going to look to see what's right and wrong you ever heard the adage of parents do what i say not what i do well that doesn't work they're going to watch everything you do um me as not having kids and robin and i have worked with youth and and kids for many years and what happens boy do they watch they watch what you do they watch what you say and you want to be the best moral example because God will use that morality to say, you know what, I, I missed something. God's moral law is important. So Peter, what he does in verse 40, he answers their question, um, 38 through 40. He says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call and with many other words that he testified and exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward generation so Peter gives them an answer and he also says that this promise is going to affect your children it's amazing I go back a lot of generations in our family we have records and I've got pictures of great great grandfathers and things like that how many ministers was in our family now, having those ministers in my family and they planted churches going back at least three or four generations before me did not save me. But what it did was they kept passing that gospel through the generations of family. And whether it be me or my first cousins have accepted Christ or not, we all have been presented the gospel. And it happened because of the ones before us. And he said, this thing that's happening to you will affect your children. It's going to affect the generations after you. Because what's happening is right at birth, you know, every, and I can include my cousins in this. Every one of us uh, were presented the gospel as, as early on as we can remember. You can go to a family reunion and you can pretty much tell the ones that have accepted it and the ones that haven't, you know. But Peter says that. He calls on them first to repent. Notice that he doesn't just go out there and say, well, you got to get baptized, you got to do this. The first thing he says is, 
you, you must repent. That old sinful self you are, you need to turn away from that. You need to place your faith in God. You need to accept Christ and have Christ change you and repent from what you've done. Um, there are many people today who argue that repentance has no place in salvation. All you have to do is just believe in Jesus. You ever hear that? Just believe. And they never talk about repentance. Um, just, um, a Brother Andrew's talking, just say this prayer. Um, nothing about repentance. You have to be willing in this, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, to turn loose of that life that you've been hanging on to. It's a surrender. I'm going to turn loose of this life. I look at it this way. And this is uh, my dad's testimony, actually. He was older. And he almost felt like he was turning loose. And it got to the point, and he had struggled with this. He was 29 when he was saved. And he had struggled begging God to save him. Nothing. One night he's convicted of his sins. And he finally tells, Lord, you know what? I know I, I, I deserve your judgment. I just get, he goes, I was almost expecting to die and go to hell right now. But he finally said, you know what? I, I don't care. I just give up. And at that moment when he gave up his sin, God saved him. There had to be repentance. There had to be a change of heart. And that's what happened. And Peter says the very first thing, you must repent. Um, if repentance has to come later, then Peter botched the gospel. Okay? Because the very first thing he says, then Peter said unto them, repent. He says, that happens first. There are two, um, it's funny because the next thing he says that they had to be baptized. There are many religions out there that go to the scripture and they say that you have to be baptized to be saved. And they misquote the scripture. I've had them do it to me. They'll say, they'll read this and they'll say in verse uh, 37 at the end, men and brethren, what shall we do? They quote it this way. They say, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? I've heard them quote the scripture that way. It doesn't say that. Peter said you have to repent and be baptized, and, and they'll tie in, you have to be baptized to be saved. Baptism is a public confession of one's private faith. Always has been, always will be. They did not specifically say, there's a couple things in here. They, one did not specifically say, what must we do to be saved? They said, what must we do? And the other thing that you have to do is put it in context. The context of the scripture is Peter's preaching a sermon that is about to explode the church. So this is about the church exploding. Okay, if somebody comes to me and they say, Scott, what do I have to do to be a part of Hallelujah Side Baptist Church? I'm going to say you need to be saved. You're going to need to repent of your sins and be saved, and you need to be baptized. That's why you've got to be part of the church. That's what Peter told these men. You want to be part of what we're doing here? You want to be equipped to do what we're doing and going out and carry the gospel? Well, here's, the, here's what you have to do to go out and carry out the gospel according to the Bible, to fulfill the commission. You must repent of your sins, and you must be baptized into a local New Testament church. People outside, and this will get arguments, people outside a local New Testament church have not been commissioned to carry out the gospel. It was meant to be done cooperatively uh, between God's people brought together because as a body, we're more powerful as individuals. We're a body. We're a body of believers. And he has commissioned us as a church to carry it out. Now, it does mean the individuals, yes, we go out and witness, but we do it together as a body. And, and there's some certain things to do that. Also, in the Greek, I'll give you a little Greek lesson real quick. He says, Then Peter said unto the men, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. In the Greek, that, that would read this way, For the Christ, the of the, is because of the. It's basically making a connection to remission. You are, you're going to repent and be baptized for the, because of the remission of sins. Because your sins have been remitted, you'll be baptized. That's exactly what we teach. You need to be baptized because your sins have been forgiven. And the baptism is an outward showing that, you know what, I place my faith in that resurrection. I go to the baptismal waters. I am buried uh, my old life, and I come up a new creation. I've been resurrected new, spiritually, waiting for the redemption of the body. Um, and we'll get into a minute. Actually, there, there's another question later in the Bible asks. when they, they, uh, There was a question asked an apostle, what shall we do to be saved? And we'll go to that in a minute. Uh, those who argue that you must be baptized to be saved use this verse as proof of that text. Um, they ignore the whole context. They ignore the whole context of what's being talked about. Um, overwhelming text testimony of the scriptures is that you're saved by grace through faith. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 teaches that, that you're saved by grace through faith. And the amazing thing about it is that the best commentary on the Bible, guess what it is? It's the Bible. There is not, if you read something, and I read this, I say, oh, you must be baptized to be saved. And there's no other scripture pointing on that. Guess what? Scott's on the wrong track. I need to find out what this is talking about. It. Um, I'm going to give you this much. It's different in our society to back then. 
a, a unbaptized believer, I think, was foreign to the apostles. I really think it was. Because these men were immediately baptized. And all through the New Testament, you saw that people were convicted of their sins. They came to Christ and immediately were baptized. Because it was the first commandment that they were to do. To, to unify themselves. To align themselves with the local New Testament church. That's kind of a foreign thing today. Because a lot of people, you know, well, I'm not sure about it yet. And it just boggles my mind. What do you mean you're not sure about it? The same Lord that saved you is telling you, you need to be baptized so you can um, start to serve me the right way. Jesus Christ himself did not start his public ministry until he was baptized. And it wasn't because he had to do it to make himself righteous. He was showing us, this is how you righteously do it. You, you follow my lead. So a person that's saved and refuses to get baptized is starting their, their Christian walk with an open rebellion against God. And he commands us to be baptized. And it's amazing, too, because I, I've never been in a church where a, a believer has been baptized. The church like, oh, that was horrible. <laughs> I, wish, I hope we don't have to set through that again. Believers rejoice when they see something. We love to see people get under the water. I'm glad we don't sprinkle. We would be left dissatisfied. You know, we like to see them. I've seen Brother Andrew almost drown people. You know, you're going down, you know, and then hold them there for a minute. And they're sitting there thinking, Lord, I'm glad I'm saved because if he drowns me, at least be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you know what? Amen. So that's good. And uh, as Peter goes on and preaches, I'm glad I numbered my pages, Jay. I'd already be in the wrong one. I'd be right retracting. In the next chapter, and we'll get into this later, but I want to kind of jump ahead. Chapter 3, go to verse 19. I'm going to ask Brother Andrew to, re to, to read that for me. 319, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Does he say anything about baptism? Nope. Nope. Did Peter forget <laughs> one chapter later that you had to be baptized to be saved? So if you had to be baptized to be saved, this great apostle, this very outspoken, charismatic speaker who uh, preached a sermon where about 3,000 souls were saved, totally forgot about baptism one chapter later. Because he's speaking specifically about salvation. It makes no sense, this argument that you have to be baptized to be saved. And here's the bottom line. I don't care what I do of myself. It's not good enough to satisfy God for salvation. Right. Nothing. And going out here in this muddy river, uh, lost and separated from God, and a dunk in that water isn't going to change that. We baptize people because they've come to Christ, confess their sins, and they're a new creature. And that bapti baptism signifies that they're a new creature. Um, when Peter called upon these men to be baptized, he was calling them to make a, a radical break from their culture and their religion. He's telling them, okay, you've been saved. After you're saved, after you repent, you need to make, make a radical break break from what your culture these are mostly jews it was could you imagine three thousand of these these staunt religion i mean they were coming to jerusalem the sacri that that pentecost and were probably even there many of them for um some of them might have been there for uh the uh it'll come to me in a minute breaking of the unleavened bread passover whoo i'll get it there in a minute very religious men very Jewish men. We would call them they probably Orthodox Jews. I mean, they were probably letter of the law men. So there was no question about their integrity as people. They were probably good citizens. I mean, nothing about their character. They were probably very religious and stand-up guys and, and people. But Peter makes a comment. You need to be baptized because you need to make a radical break from your culture and your religion. Because that culture and, the, and that religion is what crucified Jesus in the first place. And once you've done that, that symbol, that outward symbol, is going to really prove inwardly where your repentance and faith is. It's no longer married to this world religion, to your morals. You basically have made a connection with God, with Jesus Christ, and that baptism shows that. You have made a radical break. That's why I encourage people to be baptized. Let the world see what you believe. And it's, I like that we do it, you know, it's good, it's nice to be comfortable, and you got a sanctuary, and, the, and the, uh, you baptize them, and all that type of stuff. I love the river out here. Because anybody passing by knows what we're doing. You know, there's a baptism going on over there. You know, what's some crazy Baptist doing? There goes another one under. You know, don't they know it's easier than that? Just a little, you know, you can get a little glass and just sprinkle them. But, you know, no, we're going to take them down there. And we're going to baptize them the way the Bible said. He called them to make a, a, a public uh, separation from their religion, their culture, and to be identified with Christ. He calls us the same thing today. 
When we're called out of our sin, God wants us to make a radical departure from the world and identify ourselves with Christ. And if you want to grow as a Christian, it's a continual of that. Every day, he, and he does, daily gives you opportunity to more and more identify with Christ. And that's what he expects out of us. That's why we need each other. That's why we need the New Testament church. Uh, we should understand each other better than the world understands us because we know and we've been forgiven, which should make us be able to forgive each other and to be there for each other and to love each other. The outward symbol proves that the reality of their inward repentance and faith and that it showed the fact that God had forgiven their sins. When we baptize somebody, we're doing an outward showing that God has forgiven this person's sins. And we as a church has accepted them because God's accepted them. That's the cool thing about being a part of New Testament church. We accept those God who God accepts. And the other side of that, guess what? We reject those who God's reject. You're not going to see somebody come in here with a different ideology, a different religion, and get up and preach heresy and try to divide the church because we will reject them just the way God would reject them. That's, that's not being mean. That's, right. that's being godly. But when a sinner comes to us and they're brokenhearted and, they, and God's paid for their sins, we're going to relate to that because he's forgiven us our sins. We're going to baptize them and we're showing, you know what? We accept them because God accepts them. Um, that's good. Because that way, if we ever get mad at somebody because they are different than us, we wait a minute, God accepts them. Got to get over myself. So he called upon them to be baptized. They were being added to the church. They were at Peter... Uh, Wanted to know, they, what must we do? What must we do to be added to the church? Go to Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. Anthony, would you read that one for me? Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. Acts chapter 16. Yep, verse 30 and 31. Verse 30 and 31. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Okay, so this is at the, uh, when Paul and Silas was thrown in the Philippian jail, and an earthquake had come through, and the, um, the cells basically were all opened, and the dungeons or whatever. And the Philippian jailer was getting ready to kill himself because if he lost any prisoners that he would be put to death. And what happened was those bars or those dungeons weren't torn down for people to escape. They were actually torn down so that jailer could be saved. And Paul said, hey, don't harm yourself. We're here. This Philippian jailer, convicted of his sins, asked the question, what must we do? What must I do to be saved? Did Paul say anything about being baptized? To be saved... Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And you should be saying, once again, there's that connection to the house. Sure. It's good to go out and reach kids, and I love that. You want to capture a household? Get dad. Because if he has the most influence in that household. If you get dad, and he becomes converted for Christ, he's going to start witnessing to his kids. They're going to start seeing something. Uh, I could preach till the cows come home, and I won't have impact on your kids as much as you have impact on your kids. And he, he makes this statement that, you know, your life's going to change and your family's going to change because, Dad, your life has been changed. Paul um, and Peter are in total agreement. You have to confess your sins to Christ to be saved and, and come to him and believe in him and him alone. And one of the things that gets me, so once again, either Paul was totally whacked, maybe it was from being thrown in prison, he wasn't thinking straight, because he, according to a lot of the world, if I believed wholeheartedly that all of us had to be saved, we had to be baptized, I'd be preaching that. I'd make sure everybody knew, man, you got to get baptized to get saved. Paul was a lot bigger and better preacher than I ever will be. So he, he really messed up if you had to be baptized to be saved because he missed the whole part of it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the Apostle Paul was exactly right. If somebody asks me, Scott, why do I need to be saved? I'm going to give them the gospel. After that, Paul baptizes them. They get baptized later on right after this event happened. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to lead them to Christ, and we're going to do everything in our power to baptize them, uh, other than to cough to them and kicking and screaming. And maybe we should do that, Andrew. Just, after they're saved, we'll just drag them over there, kicking and screaming and get them under there, you know. But um, so Paul t gives the same gospel that Peter did. Peter extends a promise beyond that to their children and beyond them who are even afar off. As many as the Lord will call to himself, he says. Uh, while salvation on one hand requires a person to call upon the name of the Lord, on the other hand, no one calls upon the Lord unless the Lord calls him to himself. In uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 39, it, once again, he said, this is going to go out 
It, it, this promise is going to be for children. Uh, for those that are far off, I have a, a distinct belief that he's talking about the explosion of the church into the Gentile nations, that this is going to go far off. But notice what he says. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So, salvation requires that a person call upon the name of the Lord. But it also means that no one calls upon the Lord unless the Lord calls him first. I didn't. I wasn't saved because at eight years old I decided. Well, okay, today's the time. I'm time to be saved. God called me that night, and I answered. I didn't decide to be a preacher. Okay, Lord, it's time. Dad was a preacher. Great, great grandpas were preachers. It's time for me to be a preacher. It didn't happen until He called me to do it. I have cousins, and I have a brother who were raised the same way I was raised. That weren't called to preach. He didn't call everybody to preach. It's a distinctive call. Uh, this is salvation is and you answer it based on when God calls you first I don't know if Peter even understood it that the afar off was in no doubt to the Gentiles um, in verse 40 I want to notice what he says and with many other words that he testified exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward generation that word can be also uh, translated to perverse generation he exhorts it and I really think he's talking about Gentiles. That, that's, and it's funny because Peter was probably one of the biggest bigots towards Gentiles. And you read some things that he did that Paul had to straighten him out. One day he's loving them until his Jewish brethren gets along. And then, oh, wait a minute, I can't pay attention to these, these Gentiles. And he had to make a break from that. And, he was, and, and actually Peter was one of the pivotal points of uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming to the Gentiles. And the book of Acts tells that story. And... It always is going to demand a radical break from our wicked culture. And Gentiles had a wicked culture. They were looked up as Samaritans were even worse. And as we get into the study in Acts, we see that extended to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing. Verse 41. Then they gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine baptizing 3,000 people in one day? So there's... Peter and 11 other apostles because they had elected an apostle before this and then there was about 120 church members I think it was all hands on deck line them up and start baptizing them you know and the church authorized 3,000 to be sold to be saved Peter preached boldly God worked inwardly and the church was really launched that day it was established during the time of Christ Christ established the church the church did not begin on the day of Pentecost there was 120 people there uh, when that happened. It was one of the works that Jesus did in this transition from the Old Testament from Israel being the pinnacle of where the gospel would come from pointing the way that, that the Messiah would be born. The church was laid the foundation by Jesus Christ as his bride and we are to point the way to a Messiah that's returning and, and that's the age that we live in now. We live in an exciting age. I mean we've been called you know, the Bible says that we are a royal priesthood. He says we're a peculiar people. That peculiar kind of means special, but some people that know me say, yeah, you're really peculiar, all right. You know, we are a peculiar people called for a great, great work. You know, we have the most important job in the world. You have doctors and lawyers and athletes and all these great people. The New Testament church and the people that make up the body of Christ have the most important job in the world because it's a job that has eternal implications for those, for us and for those that we talk to. Since God had made Jesus both Lord and Christ, he was going to judge the world of sinners. I'm going to read the rest of this chapter out. <clears throat> Notice what they did. We see a lot of people saved. They'd even baptized, and bam, we don't see them anymore. Notice the change in these people's lives. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. The very doctrine that a lot of churches are bagging and, and that Joel Holstein said is uh, outdated and he was actually really talking about their doctrine towards homosexuality, if you really want to know the point. He was trying to make nicey nice, I guess. It said that what, the reason these people were steadfast is because they, they were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Two things happened. They believed the apostles, they stayed steadfast in that doctrine and in the fellowship with each other and in breaking in bread and prayers. Uh, they did communion together. They did, they did uh, prayers together. They were close-knit. They did fellowship together. And to say that the doctrine of the apostles, that's a really nice way of saying it's outdated. What you're really saying is the doctrine of Jesus Christ was outdated because the apostles were his messengers. It was his doctrine. It wasn't even the, um, you know, they said, well, the doctrine of the apostles is outdated. Jesus was just love. Uh, Jesus, um, if he was here today, would be outwardly 
on television, wherever he can be screaming to the high heavens that uh, people that are caught up in the abomination of homosexuality and sexual immorality and abortion are leading people to hell. And they'd want to outcast him and say he was outdated too. But the church is actually carrying that message. So, and fear came upon every soul. That means a, a great reverence, a respect. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And they all believed were together and had all things in common. Here's something amazing. They had all things in common. God's people should have everything in common. We're in this together. Uh, we've seen churches that get into fights over the, car the color of the carpet and what kind of children's program they're going to have and what kind of songs they're going to sing. And it, it's enough to make your head spin. But they said that they had all things in common. They sold their possessions and good and parted them to all men as every man had need. This is not teaching that the church was a bunch of socialists that actually... Um, everybody puts their money in and, and, and they all live equally. Well, I was talking about people in the church that had a need, a specific need. The church would make sacrifices, some of the ones that had more that God had blessed more with, and they would take care of that soul that's in need. It's not a way of government. It's a way of caring. It means that your heart bleeds for your brothers and sisters and you see a brother in need, you know what? I've got an extra loaf. I'll give you one. Well, actually, you know what? You've got kids. I'll just give it to you all because I have means to get more. It's, it's talking about an attitude, not a system of government. So my attitude toward my brothers and sisters in Christ is I'm going to take care of them. As God provides for me, I'm going to try my best to provide for them. That's why when people come together in the church, that's why we believe in offerings. We don't pass the collection plate around. But you know why? Because God should convict people that are saved to give to the church because what the church is going to do with that money is go down to an apartment complex and start preaching to kids and try to bring the gospel to them. You should, anybody that's saved, part of a church, should want to be a part of that. Can't physically go down there, provide what God's provided you. Because those things cost money. And uh, to feed the poor, to do anything that we can do in the community to help uh, people come in. To, to take care of people in our church that might come on hard times. You know, I'm willing to give of what God's given me. Um, so they sold their possessions to take care of the needs <clears throat> among themselves. <clears throat> that's an important lesson. And you'll hear me say this a lot. If we can't take care of the people that we're supposed to love within the body of Christ, we can't take care of the people outside the body of Christ. This should be easy. We should love each other knowing that we're all Christians and we're all we're brothers and sisters in Christ, that we should care for one another and give for one another. There is no way if we can't understand that lesson, there is no way God's going to send somebody in here that's tough to love because we're not there yet. But he, what he does is this should be easy. If you can give of yourselves for each other, then your church is going to be enlarged because I'll start sending you people for you to love and they can see that among yourselves. In verse 46, he goes, they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did uh, eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Everything they did was singleness of heart. That was to carry out the gospel. They continued daily with one another, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I don't know if that's the best sermon I ever preached other than the one on the Sermon on the Mount, but that was a pretty good one. I've never preached a sermon. I don't know, if Brother Andrew, maybe you have, where about 3,000 souls were saved. I don't know if I'd know what, I'd be so, I, I'd probably repent myself and want to get baptized that day. I mean, it'd be like, wow, what just happened here? Seven weeks before this sermon, T Peter was a total disaster. He had denied Christ. He was weeping bitterly. And we read last week that Jesus had told um, the women there to go tell the apostles and Peter that's in the book of Mark you know I'm forgiven you got things to do and within seven weeks God had trans Peter was already saved but he still had this pride thing going on God had put him in a position that he could preach a sermon like that so my prayer for us is just as God broke Peter's will and spirit seven weeks earlier when he was saying Lord I'll die with you I'll lay my life down for you and Jesus said no you won't you'll actually deny me three times <clears throat> before the rooster crows and God broke his spirit and his will this as God did that I prayed that each and every one of us that God would break our will that we'd be able to get up and boldly preach and teach and talk to people the way Peter did he did not that was not a a politically correct sermon oh by the way this prophecy in, in Joel you all are guilty of that. You crucified Christ by your sins, and God holds you responsible directly for his crucifixion. If you believe in that resurrection, I'll save you and add you to the church. That's, you know, that would be called hate speech today. Well, how dare him say that, that I'm that guilty? You know what? Men have to know they're guilty. Men have to be wounded before they can be healed. They need to hear 